Welcome, welcome everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Mac Barrett. I'm the Curator of Public Programming here at Roosevelt House. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Hunter College President Rab and Roosevelt House Director Harold Holzer to this evening's discussion. Um, it seems an opportune time right between Veterans Day and Thanksgiving, time, and Thanksgiving to do an event that enables Roosevelt House to show some gratitude to veterans of wars past and present. Um, and I'm happy to do so by welcoming these two luminaries from the Hunter College MFA program, one in, and a, a distinguished alum, Phil Cly, winner of the 2014 National Book Award for redeployment. Um, he's also the author of Missionaries, which was named one of the 10 best books by, of 2020 by the Wall Street Journal. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the Atlantic. He currently teaches fiction at Fairfield University and is a board member for Arts in the Armed, Armed Forces. Speaking with him tonight, we're also pleased to welcome Saeed Serafazi. Ah. It, was so well. it was going so well. <laughs> Serafizadeh, <laughs> Serafizadeh, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Serafizadeh leads the creative nonfiction track at Hunter College's MFA program and is the author most recently of the story collection American Estrangement, a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize. His memoir, When Skateboards Will Be Free, was selected as one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times. And his story collection, Brief Encounters with the Enemy, was a finalist for the pen. Robert Bingham Fiction Prize. With that, please welcome Saeed Serafizadeh and Phil Cly. Thank you. By the I, way, he, he messes with me. Well, I, I did an event where I was introducing him, actually, not, not that long ago, which was uh, a delight. And right as I got to say his name, I was like, Saeed? And he looked at me like this, he went. <laughs> <laughs> by the, and by the way, that's because we have like the polar opposite of names. <laughs> you, mine is very simple, and it gets mispronounced, and everyone gets it wrong. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, mine is 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 tricky. It's it clay. It's pronounced clay. That's a joke. <laughs> That's a joke. Clay, Phil Cly, yeah. Phil Cly. And the other thing, so I we did do Fairfield University reading, and I was woefully underdressed <laughs> for that. And then I was like, today I'm going to dress up, and you have still outdressed me. I just had to be a little bit. Yes. My my kids gave me this dinosaur tie, so got to wear it. I had to wear it. Got to wear it. That's. That's how I had to um, go out the door. And Dean Polsky is here today. <laughs> By the way, I, let, can we just do a quick shout out? Mike, hi Mike. A uh, quick shout out to the $52 million that, that Hunter yeah, College, I mean, amazing. come on, that's amazing. Jennifer Robb, yes, yes. That was amazing for the nursing school. Um, so we're just waiting one, one for the creative writing department. <laughs> when, when's that coming? Okay, all right, let's get, so. Uh, Phil, congratulations on the book, Uncertain Ground. Uh, I got a bunch of questions for you. We're going to chat for a while, then we're going to open it up. Afterwards, there's a reception. What is there, wine? What's going to be in there? What, what do we have? Mac, what's going to be in wine? Is that wine? <laughs> okay, <laughs> and we've got wine. That we've got. Yeah. And, you're, and you'll be doing a signing. Yes. You'll yeah. be doing a signing. Um, can, I, can I start with, um, I told them I was going to hit them with some, some tough questions. But let's uh, start with the title. Let's get folks up sure. to speed on this. So it's uncertain ground. Tell us what's, what's the ground and what's uncertain about it. <laughs> um, uh, there's a variety of things. I mean, so w one of them is, is the title is, is sounds kind of negative, and, and, you know, the book cover is not like... Um, it's not one that assures you that everything <laughs> is fine. Uh, and in terms of... Well, by the way, can you, I don't know, if, can folks see it? There's a crack in the middle of, you can't see that all the way back there, can you? There you go, uh, yeah. Okay, and you got <laughs> it. What if I do this? Okay, yes, go ahead. So, yeah. and there are obvious ways in which that refers to sort of our political mm -hmm. environment, um, military issues. I. <sighs> I have a, a sort of distrust of certainty, actually, and which is one of the, th the, the kind of recurrent themes of the book. And so uncertain ground is not always necessarily a bad place to be if one in, 
uh, is aware of it. I'm, I, you know, this is a book of essays, and, and, and some of them are argumentative essays, but uh, I, I do feel like there is a way in which sort of embracing complexity and the attendant uncertainty is very important for thinking your way through any, any issue, especially issues as complex as war and peace, as the American self-identity and our relationship to our military and our soldiers. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these essays were born out of anger uh, and uh, <laughs> I don't want to curse, uh, but let's say I, I used to joke that, that for a decent number of the essays, the, the originating title was F all you effing effers, uh, and then in parentheses, including myself, right? And that, that like self-reflexive turn is important for it not just being like polemic because you know, you come back from war and you have this sense that there's something really morally important that's happening and, and, and everybody around you doesn't seem to be caring about it the same way that you do and you wanna make them care. And then it's like, okay, but in what way? How do we actually think about this? And, and does the, the experience that I had overseas where I saw you know, a small fraction of a war and where I didn't necessarily understand what was, what was happening, you know, it's very easy to feel like you have more authority to speak about something than you actually do. You're, so when you say uncertain ground, then actually that's, that's in your mind a positive. <laughs> yeah, it can be. It can right? Be. You're yeah. saying let's not, let's not have this sort of... If you acknowledge it, you need to understand that. And, 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 and also, I mean, I think to bring it to military policy, I think we're obsessed with whether it's military policy or a whole range of life. We want things that have certain answers. We want a yes or a no, right? And, you know, I, I tell a story in the book uh, about uh, Ian Fishback, uh, who unfortunately uh, died recently. Um, he's in the Special Forces. And some of his, there was sort of like a mortar strike that killed two soldiers. And he was in this region where there were Sunni tribesmen as well as Kurds, and there was a lot of sort of bad blood between them that went back for for a while, uh, and there was a lot of very good reason for both sides to distrust each other, we'll put it that way. Um, and he was interested in trying to maintain a very tentative sort of peace. He knew probably which tribe, uh, from which tribe the mortars had come. And he probably would have been justified doing some kind of kinetic strike if he had wanted to. He chose not to. He chose to bring in the, the sheikh and talk to him in a very tense meeting and essentially try and work out a better political compromise. If he had done a kinetic strike, used violence, right? He could have said something bad happened and we responded to it. You know, we killed people, we put, put people away, whatever. Um, and that would have seemed like a very clear win. Instead, he continued a nebulous arrangement, uh, like political arrangement between him, the local tribes, the and, and the sort of tentative peace held out until the end of his, his deployment there. And I think that was sort of like a microcosm for me of in America, we have become extremely adept at using violence, right? And we were very good at kill capture. We, we've developed over the past 20 years the most sophisticated method of, of kill capture that the world has ever seen. So, you know, like, you know, the Navy SEALs and, and Rangers and, and, and so on in Joint Special Operations Command in 2004 are doing about 12 raids a month. By 2006, they're doing about 300, right? And that's not because the Navy SEALs, like, went to the gym, you know, and improved their runtime, right? The whole apparatus and mechanism behind which we do targeting change. And so we can reach out all around the world and kill somebody in Afghanistan, in the Horn of Africa, wherever. And then what happens after that? How does that change the sort of local, cultural, political dynamics? That's nebulous, right? That's hard to actually measure. But you can still rack that up as a win. And so even though over the past 20 years, the overwhelming lesson of, I think, Iraq and Afghanistan is that the politics and the culture matter, the second and third order consequences of violence matter tremendously. 
even though that is obviously the lesson, if you look at the sorts of institutions that we've built, we've built institutions that are very good at killing people, at doing, you know, like surgical strikes, while allowing other organs of, of US power to wither. And so, <laughs> yes, we have mechanisms that can provide us you know, the yes or no answer of war, right? L alive or dead. But that, that sort of uncertain space, I think we actually need to really grapple with that if we want to be effective. Um, just to get folks up to speed on your history, so you actually joined the Marines uh, in 2004, right? Three years after 9-11? So I, I, I went to <laughs> Officer Canada School in 2004. 2004. Yep. And, and, and you, you go to Iraq in 2007? Yes. Okay. Um, and tell them, so when you were there, you did not see combat. No, you I was a public affairs public officer. Public affairs. Yeah. Uh, your, your idea then, uh, or you tell me, I don't, I don't think you were thinking about being a writer then, right? You had an idea of... I always wrote. I mean, like, okay. uh -huh. my, my initial, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a, a foreign service officer, right? Um, and then, you know, when I was in college, we were at war in two countries, so it seemed like the thing to do if you wanted to serve your country was to join the military, right? Which is what I did. And then I was like the weirdo who was memorizing poetry while out on field exercises. They were like, you should, you should be a public affairs officer. <laughs> they were like, we know just to roll for you. Yeah. So is it it, was it tough, or is it something else, to, um, you talk about that being a Marine is about sort of being part of a collective, mm -hmm. the brotherhood of being a Marine. Mm -hmm. um, but you have been talking tonight about that you like to live in ambiguity. You are a writer, and a, a writer is, or you correct me if I'm wrong, that's, an indiv that's, a, that's a solitary pursuit. How do we, how do we go, or am I, miss, am I missing something? I'm wondering how do we go from this collective, from the brotherhood, to you as a writer alone, working on your own material? I mean, I think writing is about relationships, right? I don't think it's so solitary. The romantic poet... Okay, so then that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, like, yeah, like, you, you spend a lot of time, you know, scribbling things down, but, like, I don't know. There are lots of jobs where you're, like, working on your own. Mm -hmm. um, like, a cobbler is a solitary pursuit, okay. too, you know? Like, this... Fair that enough. Doesn't, doesn't mean that it's like about isolation from you know broader collectives. Um, it's about you know making shoes. Uh, but isn't it also? But, but it, writing okay. is communication, okay. right? Okay. Uh, All is, right. Jump all. Books are thick letters to friends. But it's right? also about sticking with your own idea of what something is. Here's my vision of it. I am not. <laughs> am I going down the wrong path? It's. <sighs> yes and no, because. <laughs> okay. This is the thing about, especially fiction, right? Fiction is not, this is my idea. Fiction is like, I'm trying to invite you, the reader, into an experience. And I don't know what your response is going to be. And in fact, you, this is an invitation to you to creatively respond to what I'm doing in ways that I can't envision or imagine. That's the great thing about literature. It's, it's that it is open, that it, it, it is an invitation to a creative response, right? So, you know, you think of like, um, the Iliad, right? I don't read the Iliad the way that like a classical Greek would read the Iliad or the way that a veteran of the Napoleonic Wars would read the Iliad or whatever. I don't read it the way Jonathan Shea read it, right? Where he's like reading it in terms of, of post-traumatic stress. And that's fine. It's not that like, you know, through history, different people interpret the Iliad different ways and Simone Weil has this and, you know, whatever. Um, and then eventually through some sort of like Hegelian synthesis, we uh, reach the perfect, true explanation of the Iliad and then we can sort of discard the work. No, like the Iliad is this tremendously powerful work that people respond to dramatically differently based on their own experiences. And their individual reading of the work brings something to it and creates something anew with each reading. And that is the, you know, the glory of literature done well. So you see that as a collective, as yeah, part of being absolutely. part of something. Yeah. Do you see the reader, how do you see the reader? Friend, foe, 
<laughs> somewhere in between. Sometimes they're faux, Sometimes as I have learned. Um, yeah. Uh. <laughs> when are they faux? Oh, I mean, and I'm I not mean, talking about when someone tweets something bad about you. No. I'm talking uh, about when you're creating. Are you? No, I mean, I, look, there's some people who are going to have a hostile read. I, I mean, when I was writing my first book, I had this, like, image of, of all the veterans waiting in line to kick my ass if I screwed things up, right? Yeah. And... And that was important, like, all right, like I want to do justice to this experience. But at the same time, in the sense that, like, if I don't piss anybody off, I've failed, right? Because there, there are corners of experience that people don't want to deal with, right? They don't want exposed. They think it's a betrayal for you to talk about them that are nevertheless deeply important for, for discussing anything. And so <sighs> there's a sort of fidelity to the experience, but but also a certain amount of betrayal, perhaps, uh, that's involved if you're going to really delve deeply in, in, into the heart of something. So, you know, a big part of your book is that we have been at war for a very long time. Yeah. And if I may, no one cares anymore. We are totally, we meaning the citizens of this country are are very disconnected. In fact, people don't, don't you, you talk about how people don't even think we're at war. Right. They've, they've forgotten. Well, so, so to go back to what I was discussing about with kill capture, right? So <sighs> we don't have ground troops in Afghanistan anymore. Uh, we can we can still kill people in Afghanistan, as we recently show. Uh, we have troops in the Horn of Africa. Uh, we have troops doing counterterrorism missions in a whole host of countries. In the opening of the book, I talk about you know the number of countries where we're killing people, and it's not quite certain how many of those there are. Um, there's not a lot of transparency from the Department of Defense. And, you know, after we pulled out of Afghanistan, you know, President Biden announced that, like, you know, we're finally at peace. You know, there was no longer, we we're no longer at war. And in, in the next sentence, he was like, but we can still do over the counter, uh, over the horizon strikes um, when we need to, which is sort of like, we're, we're no longer at war with this country, but we're still going to reserve the right to kill people occasionally. And that's just a very weird thing, right? Where we just have a tremendous capacity to reach out and kill people at a great distance with very little um, political engagement, very little oversight from Congress. It's no longer a political issue if you know the president's gonna send more troops to the Horn of Africa to support that mission, which nobody ever voted for. Um, then it's sort of like, okay, it gets reported in the New York Times, but it's, it's, it's not an issue that your average congressman needs to actually say whether or not they support. And I think that that is, that's a sort of problem, an ethical problem for a democracy. I think it, um, I think it, 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 it probably in the long term leads to bad policy because we have a lot of, I think, military policies that are based on avoiding hard decisions rather than, than making them, right? Um, there's not necessarily any reason to think that al-Shabaab is gonna strike the homeland, but if they ever did, you don't wanna be the president to have you know, ended that mission. And so you might as well, in the absence of, of anybody being forced to make hard political decisions about whether we should be at war there or not, just kind of continue that mission. And, and so you have a kind of like least politically costly um, military policy happening where we have this kind of tremendous capabilities you know, that are being used with the lowest level of visibility. I don't think that's good for the long term. You, you mentioned, I think you talk about in the book about that uh, Congress has been, they're sort of left out of this. Right, so we, Congress, after 9-11, Congress authorized use of military force from the president, and it was kind of vaguely worded, right? Um, and you know, we're able to go against the Taliban and, and associated forces. Uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda and also associated forces. And associated forces has come to mean all sorts of things. And actually, President Obama was one of the people who really leaned hard into expanding what that term meant, right? And that was something from the beginning of his presidency that they were interested in. Kind of the most famous example of this is Obama pulled troops out of Iraq, right? With a lot of fanfare and ended the war in Iraq. And then you had the rise of ISIS, and then they started reintroducing troops. But they didn't want to say that they were starting the war again, right? 
uh, especially not since Obama had been the you know preferred candidate of the anti-war movement, and um, and they had trumpeted that the war in Iraq was over, and so they're sort of gradually escalating the number of troops in Iraq, and they're calling you know they're saying well we're you know we're putting advisors in, uh, but they're not boots on the ground, right? Because you know I guess special forces guys hover above the ground on <laughs> hoverboards or something. And then you would have these, au au there was a sort of infamous press conference with, uh, I think it was the, the Pentagon press secretary where one of these guys had been in combat and they were trying to explain that like, okay, so sometimes our troops end up in combat situations, but we're not sending them into combat, right? <laughs> Which is uh, quite a fantastic bit of hair splitting. Um, sometimes you, you end up in a pregnancy situation, but don't say that you're pregnant. And, and then uh, I was in 2015, as this, this whole thing is ramping up, I did an event in Washington, D.C. Uh, and there were a bunch of like, you know, three and four star generals, people from the NSC in the audience. And um, Susan Rice introduced me and the other panelists. And, and uh, so there's all these active duty military brass and, and high, high up muckety mucks. And there's, there's about a dozen severely injured troops. You know, we're talking about guys who've lost limbs, uh, suffered severe burns, you know, lost their ears and, and such. And in the introduction, you know, she's Ambassador Susan Rice is talking about the the importance of veterans issues, which is what the panel was about. Uh, and then she says, uh, you know, one of our proudest accomplishments in the Obama administration is ending the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And somebody in the audience went, <coughs> you know, and it was just kind of astounding because it was like some of the guys in the audience are in charge of sending more people over. Like who, are you lying to us? Are you lying to yourself? What the, heck, you know, what the heck is going on? And, and Obama said the same thing at a fundraiser uh, about two months later, right? So it was like a talking point that they were trying to do. And even though we're amping up our military presence, we're killing a lot of people, okay? Uh, and doing a lot of airstrikes, drone strikes, et cetera. This, this isn't supposed to count as war. And what, it, what, what they really wanted was, you, the American citizen, are not supposed to care about it. And certainly not want any of your elected officials to exact a political price for the decisions that they're making. When you hear stuff like um, combat situation, <laughs> um, as opposed to combat. I mean, as a writer, you're delighted. That's, <laughs> th that's exactly what I was gonna get at. Is that something that strikes the authorial gene in you, where you go, ah, I've just, I've, I'm picking that up. So w when you're writing about something like this, th the difficulty is, you're talking about a lot of, you're talking about a lot of boring stuff. You're talking about authorizations for the use of military force. You're talking about changes in how we do kill capture. You're talking about a lot of abstract things in a system that is designed to have no human face, right? And actually, Throughout, like this is, I think, in many ways, a, a problem that's not just about war, but many different aspects of American political and economic life is like extremely important systems that feel very abstract to us and where there's not like one guy, you know, who you could say, that's the guy doing the bad thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's more sort of system by which we wage war that has operated across presidents, right? Um, and which carries with it, I think, serious hazards. How do you talk about that? And you need to find ways to make the abstract humanly legible, right? And so any, any time you can come up with something that just is delightfully absurd, that's a gift. By the way, that's a hell of a line. I'm going to steal that. You need to make the abstract the same one, humanly legible. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things you do in the book, I'd love to pose, guess what Phil does in the book? Um, well, there's a lot of human beings. You make these sure. concepts abstract. We meet a lot of, I want to say characters. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this is, we're, we're creative writers. Yeah. This is how we talk about it sometimes. They're human beings. But these become characters in your book that illustrate 
points you want to make. You talk about writing argument. By the way, can you define that? What, is, what does that mean, argumentative essay? I mean, like, I have a, I, I have a position, right? I, I try not to write straightforward polemic. Like, in, in the book, I'm, I'm, I'm still heavily committed to narrative, right? And I kind of, what I want is for the reader to know what I think. You know, which which might be a pretty straightforward cash out, like we should repeal the authorizations for the use of military force that justified Afghanistan and Iraq, and 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 not I don't I'm not a pacifist. I, I think there is a absolute role for for America overseas, and actually, a lot of the things that we developed over the past twenty years that I'm talking about in this very negative way now have been put to pretty good use in Ukraine, right? Um, so it, it's it's complicated, but um, well, you, you but have opinions. Yeah, I have opinions, and I want the reader to know them. But I kind of want them to sort of join me in the way that I'm thinking about it, right? Uh, the the kind of trajectory of me mulling over these things, and oftentimes that the, the way that that cashes out is through particular stories in the book that I'm sort of posing against each other, and it might be a story from the First World War, and a kind of great hero of the first, American hero of the First World War, uh, counterposed against the story of two Iraqi interpreters, uh, one of whom is, you know, at the, at the time of the writing was still in Iraq, trying to get to the United States in hiding, and one of whom had come to the United States and then joined the army and went back to Iraq as a soldier. Uh, and, you know, those three stories together were deeply compelling human stories to me. But when you kind of find the connections between them, they start to say things about like American identity and how we conceive of ourselves and how our self-conception is related to immigration policy and um, the mythology of the soldier. And you, you know, you read that particular essay, you know what I think about you know, the issue that I care about but you're also sort of invited to sort of perceive those questions through these human narratives across time. Let me ask you, um, so this is Phil's first nonfiction book. Wrote a collection of short stories, wrote a novel. Uh, what, what do you feel is, are some of the differences between how you approach fiction and how you're approaching these, how, you, how do you approach the essays? Uh, it, it goes to what I, a little bit of what, what I said before. In fiction, you want to bring people into an experience. In nonfiction, you're inviting them to think through an argument with you. You, when you write your stories, um, the opinion, I, or or tell me, do you <laughs> have an opinion when you're writing them? Do you have a point of view? Do you have an idea or an argument in them? Sure, but the uh -huh. fun of fiction is that like. As you're writing, either you, you're, the opinion you thought you had gets destroyed, right? Because you, if you write according to what your opinion is, the fiction is dead on the page. It's so boring, right? And I mean, like, there's a lot of. Uh, why? Why does it become boring? What's what? What's? Because human beings and reality does not reduce to talking points, ever. So it's always more complicated. I think oftentimes, you know, there's sort of periods of history where it feels like we want that from our fiction, you know? Um, you know, there's like a lot of like bad political fiction, you know? Uh, Do you want to name names? Just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. I. I have written some book reviews, but <laughs> we can look them up. But um, where you know what the author's position is, and you're like, well, why am I reading this instead of an op-ed? Like, if you want to be a pundit, just be a pundit. Uh, the worst example is like when you have somebody who I remember read a book recently, and there was a character who came on to just give, who's identified as the Republican. And they come on literally just to give the worst arguments for the death penalty that you've ever heard. And like, I personally am opposed to the death penalty. I was so annoyed at this. I was like, 
I said, this person isn't dumb because everybody who thinks that way is dumb. This person is dumb because you made them. You made them. You're a fiction writer. You made this. Like, if I go to, like, a kindergartner's karate class, right, and I just beat the crap out of everybody, and they're like, I'm, like, the greatest fighter in the world. No. Like, you just you stack the deck for yourself. Like, and it's actually harder to do that with the kindergartners than to make a dumb character who you can just beat up on. Like, it's much more interesting, you know, like, the thing I love about Dostoevsky is, like, you know, what is, like, what is the thing that I hate the most? That idea, I'm gonna make the smartest, most articulate character in my book say all that stuff. And there's a great letter uh, where he's talking about Ivan Karamazov, and he's like, the adults have ridiculed my, like, my obscurantism and, you know, the anachronistic character of my faith. They could never conceive of an attack on religion as powerful as the one that I wrote. It's like, yeah, like, you know, like, Ivan Karamazov, that is a powerful character who's inspirational to, like, all kinds of atheists, right? And it was you know, what Dostoevsky was arguing against, but he knew that if, 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 if what he believed was serious, was worthy of being serious, you know, you don't create little, like, fluffy bunnies to kick around in opposition. Like, you know in the real world you're going to come up against the grizzly bear that's Ivan. And, like, that's more interesting in fiction. So on, on that note, I'm wondering... Um, Proust complains about these folks, too, right? Like, in, in, in Search of Things, Lost Things, they're talking about, like, oh, the people, like, the, the young people today, they just want novels of, like, sociological... Import, mm. political import, right? Like it's like a revolving thing. They're always that kind of people. Always want fiction that's just going to tell them what they already believe. But we don't. Even if we enjoy that fiction when we're reading it, we forget it immediately, and it never lasts. Yeah, it's like we we read fiction, or I try to to be challenged, yeah, not to just be yeah patted on the back. So I can start with an idea. I mean, I'll give you an, in missionaries. There's a character uh, Juan Pablo. And uh, the, the way that missionaries was structured was like to have characters who are in all these institutions that I'm concerned with, right? So, because I wanted to explore how we wage war, right? And so the structure of the novel is set up so that just by the nature of who I was writing about, you'd explore that world. So like one of the characters is a journalist and she starts in Afghanistan. One of the characters is a American special forces guy and you, you meet him in Iraq. Uh, one of them is a Colombian uh, military officer and who works with the American and one of them is a, is a kid who ends up in, in paramilitaries, right? So you sort of, the various different institutions that are related to violence um, and how America does violence, right? Through partner forces, through whatever, um, you know, these characters are gonna be a part of those worlds. But then you start, so that's how it was conceived. That's the architecture. But then you start writing it Right, and actually the first chapter that I wrote from Juan Pablo's, there's like a dinner between him and Mason and they're talking about military policy. And the first time I read it, I was like, this is boring. Like, I'm bored. And if I'm bored, the reader is definitely bored. So I gave Juan Pablo a daughter just to have somebody to shake things up, right? And then like, all of a sudden, Juan Pablo's whole, in that novel, that novel, his whole, every bit with Juan Pablo, it's about his relationship with his daughter from start to finish, right? That is about that relationship. And that just fundamentally changed because like, oh, like this is what I thought was interesting when I was writing and it was all about the ideas. And then you start the fiction and you're like, ah, oh, the fiction demands something more complicated. And then you just go with that. Uh, I just wanted to go back. So uh, talking about um, the brotherhood, the collective, the writer, you're saying, yeah. you're saying the hey, the writer is part of the collective too. Um, reader as friend or foe or somewhere in between. Any feelings of self censorship when you're writing? And I'm not no. talking. And I'm not talking about that you're, get, freedom. that you're going to get in trouble. Right. That the the government's going to come after. I'm just wondering, are there things? No, you're saying no. That's a hard no. When I write, I feel a sense of total anarchic freedom. And then you have to just, you know, look at what you write. When, when I wrote the first book, I wrote a, a story called uh, In Vietnam They Had Whores. And when I'm writing it, I was like, nobody needs to see this. It was about, I mean, in some ways, like, messed up by notions of masculinity and sexual violence and, and 
more about those things than about the military, to be honest. And when I, and it's, you know, it's a rough story. Uh, there's some difficult things that happened there. And I wrote it. I said, nobody needs to see this. And then I looked at it, I was like, oh, it's good. My grandma's going to read this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I'd written it, and I thought it was good. I thought and it said something valuable, so my yeah, grandma read it. Grandma you know? read it. Yeah. She was fine. Before we uh, open it up for questions, hard-hitting questions from the audience, or is the audience... What's going on with the audience, friend or foe? Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. I know we're all friends. This is like a wedding. It's like the foe side <laughs> that's and right, the that's right. friend Wait, side. We're only going to take it from this side. <laughs> um, let's talk about Hunter. Yeah. Let's plug, let's plug the MFA program. It's huh? amazing. So, okay. That's what I wanted to hear. Um, so you're in, a, in uh, Iraq, 07. That's when you go over. So when did... When can we get the, like, so when are you going, hey, man, I really want to pursue writing? I always wrote, you know. And uh, you're writing <coughs> there, by the way. We got to yeah. talk, we also got to talk about PSOD. <laughs> yeah. It's a little inside thing. Uh, yeah, okay. If you read the book, you'll, you'll know what that is. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, like, let's be right, like, the disease strikes young. But also, <coughs> Tom Slay, yes. the poetry, Hunter Poetry. Professor. Uh, uh, I had studied with him in undergrad. And so when he knew I was going into the military, he's like, all right, it's like, you know, you, you got to read the best stuff that was ever written about war. So he had me read Celine and all of Hemingway's short stories and David Jones and, and War and Peace and, and Isaac Babel's short stories and, you know, all this great stuff. And, uh, and then when I was getting out of the military, the GI Bill and the plan was I was going to go to get my MFA and the GI Bill would take care of it and then uh, become a teacher. So I was going to go to teacher's college. And The idea was I'll get an MFA and teach what? Well, I'll, I'll get an MFA and then I'll go to teacher's college and get licensed to teach high school English. That was the plan. That was the goal. I, that was the goal. And I did do a semester at teacher's college and, and taught mm -hmm. middle schoolers. Actually, I had fifth through eighth graders, um, which was really fun uh, and crazy. Uh, I had them to myself. Like you weren't, you're not supposed to just have the class to yourself, but I did. Um, <laughs> for reasons we can get to, in, but, uh, and so Tom was like, you, you got to come to Hunter, like, he's like incredible, and, you know, I studied with Cullen McCann, Peter Carey, Nathan Englander, Claire Massoud, Patrick McGrath, like, just incredible writers, and they're still, like, just an amazing, uh, roster of writers, uh, it's like, I'm, I'm feeling older, it's like, a, I've been, like, turnover, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, you know, just this incredible uh, group of writers teaching now. And so, you know, I read, I read their work, and I was like, yeah, you need to, you need to come here. What did, you l what, did, what did the MFA program give you that well, you didn't have before? So a community of really good writers, uh, some of them I'm, I'm still in touch with. and uh, Class, cl The classmates. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, actually, Bill Chang mm -hmm. showed up here last week to come to this event. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. um, Tell them who Bill Chang is. Uh, Bill Chang wrote Southern Cross the Dog, which is a beautiful novel. Rave reviews. Yeah. And he actually owes me. He needs so to send he me So th he work. thought the event was last week. Yeah. And this is what makes this even a worse story. You know where he lives? Coney Island. <laughs> <laughs> so he came all the way out from Coney Island. Yeah. Um, you got to just go to his place and just do like a yeah, chat with him, you, know, we, you, we, you we, and him. We've traded each other, uh, worked with each other. Lauren Holmes, who wrote Barbara the Slut and other people, which is a great collection of short stories. Uh, uh, you know, Caitlin Greenidge, um, you know, incredible students. And then also like... Prof yeah, all got on to publish. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, more folks. But um, in addition to that, you know, like the professors... Look, I was talking about how you, you come back from war and you're like... Huh, and write stories about war. And I've got something to say, and nobody can say anything because I'm the only one who's been to war. You know, <laughs> I remember Colin McCann being like, "I don't know what's right, but that's not right." You know, <laughs> like and I was like mad because he was correct that I was, you know, BSing, and he, you know, what wasn't right? What wasn't right? I'd written a character, and he didn't buy it. He didn't buy the character. He didn't buy the, the character. character. Doesn't seem real. It's not yeah. brought to life. I was like, and who? you were like, "No, this is based on someone real." Who is yeah. this Irishman? Yeah. 
you know, Irish writer to tell me what is like an accurate depiction of war. Apparently Cullum, but, <laughs> you know, because um, he just had that, you know, he's a good reader. You know, he, he didn't have experience in war, but he knows human beings. You've got to figure out how you take your experience yeah. and then how you translate it onto the page. That's, well, fl that's going to be flat for a reader. It's not even my experience. It's like how to fully imagine the thing that you're trying mm. to create on the page. Right? How you take your imagination and put yeah, it onto exactly. the page. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, just, they're just great, great readers, right? Who's got a question for Phil? Oh, everybody's got a question. <laughs> All right. Who do we... Who's got the mic? Oh, we got the mics back there? There we go. Oh, here, here. Let's. Let, we're going to start with Dean Polsky. <laughs> That's. Thank you. First, thank you. Thank you both. Um, so, what, Phil, I just made a, an observation about Colin McCann. You'll like this. I found a factual error in one of his books, and I pointed it out to him. <laughs> so I got under his skin because <laughs> he was trying to be historically accurate, and he missed it. What was What was the error? What did you remember? Yeah, he identified a particular airplane at the wrong time. It wasn't, didn't and exist. And you went, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. And how did he take it? How did he receive it? He shook his head and said, damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's, here's my question. You guys have been talking about the book for about 45 minutes. And the one word that seems not to have come up in this conversation from the title is citizenship. Yeah. You talked about Congress. You talked about faceless institutions. So where does citizen, what is citizenship to you, and where does it come in? So, it's a big question. <laughs> um, and I think one of the concerns with the book is there's this sense of American identity, right? That is always a contested thing. And that sense of American identity is often bound up with war, right? Um, and war gets bound up with other things like immigration, uh, like the notion of the melting pot. And we go from, you know, Woodrow Wilson penning some of the most beautiful things about how, like, you know, it's the immigrant who's going to rejuvenate the American spirit because you know, nobody leaves their country without this ideal in their mind of what America could be. And, you know, when they get here, they must be disappointed because some of us are very disappointing. And yet they're going to be the ones who are going to create this, you know, rejuvenate this, this ideal that we've never lived up to. And then like a couple years later, he's talking about how like the hyphen in, you know, whatever American is like the, the forked tongue of a serpent, <laughs> you know. Um, and so there are historical, a lot of historical sort of um, aspects of the book because I think that, you know, we, we, we think of these sort of disputed categories that we have in our head um, that are often sort of constructed out of bits of the past, right? And when you go back into the past and look at how they were constructed, you, you also find other pieces of the past that you can use <laughs> to try and create a new image of American identity moving forward that can guide you as you act, right? I, I, I think of American identity in much the way that, that Ralph Ellison did, right? Like, on the one hand, America is this concrete place that was born in a bloody uh, war, right? Um, this the, the, the poet Jeffrey Hill, you know, has a line about, um, we live by blood, the hot, the cold, no bloodless myth can hold, right? Like, we're not just about abstract ideals, right? We're about history and blood and affected ties and relationships. But on the other hand, America, as Ellison says, is an abstract, futuristic nation, right? That's bound together by these, like, sacred words, words like equality and democracy and so on, that we're forever eating and regurgitating and eating again. And that that sort of progression towards the future as you cobble together from the bits of usable history that you have an image of what America might be or could be um, the the sort of patriotic commitment of the individual citizen right is to forming that vision and trying to instantiate it in reality right and some of those is about sort of 
just trying to articulate what American identity is and what it should be and what it could be. And then some of it is like very nuts and bolts practical stuff like, you know, lobbying Congress to uh, change policy, being locally involved um, with groups and organizations doing work that is related to that conception, right? So, you know, there's, there, there's talk about you know, people who work in the humanitarian space working on uh, refugee and, and uh, visa issues, right? And so, you know, for those folks, in some ways the work is like very granular. It's like this one uh, Iraqi who served with Marines, who was in combat, uh, who injured himself, injured his back while he was serving with the Marines and is now in hiding, is trying to get a special Im immigrant visa to come to the United States. And, you know, the appeal for a lot of these humanitarian workers who are working on his case is like this specific guy, right? And the power of his story, but related to some of the things, right, that, that lead them into that work is an image of what America could and should be, and it's not. Um, how about right in the back? With, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, thank you very much, very interesting. A question I while you're talking came up about the Ukraine. Yeah. And what our role, I mean, are we having a pretend fight with Russia? You know, are we, what do we do? How much do we support? I, I also noticed that it tends to slip off the front page and it's still really very real for a lot of people. So I know we have experts over there. I don't know what is, what is that? And you know, it, it's like uncertain ground, so. I mean, I mean, it's not a pretend fight. It's a very real fight. <laughs> um, They're tossing some softballs at you tonight, huh? <sighs> I mean, so it is difficult to say exactly how involved we are because a lot of, of there's been a lot of reporting about things, but uh, for obvious reasons, there's a certain amount of secrecy around exactly what we're doing. I mean, like, the most obvious thing is and most important thing is supplying them with a lot of material, right? Uh, high Mars systems, most talked about, but but beyond that, um, there's diplomatic work, right? Um, because it's very important for Ukraine to be able to prosecute this fight, that it have have the support of, of a lot of nations. Um, and so, you know, we, I don't know what the international environment, Ukraine would still have a ton of support, but I don't know what the international environment would be if, for example, Donald Trump had been president when the war in Ukraine broke out, right? There's no question that it would be, it would be different in important ways, uh, in ways that I don't think would be good, good for Ukraine. Uh, there's intelligence-related things. Um, you know, Ukraine was killing a lot of Russian generals, right? Uh, the Duffel blog, which is like the, the onion for uh, the military, had an article recently which was like, Russian general celebrates two weeks of still being alive. Um, and there has been contrasting reports about how that has happened, uh, but some of them have suggested that, that uh, America has aided with intelligence and targeting, right? Whether, whether they've done that specifically, we definitely aided them with targeting. Right and intelligence, and that's extremely important. So, uh, why are we doing that? For a whole host of reasons. Um, I think, in general, it is very, very good if nations get the message that it is disastrously bad for you if you try and do a 19th century style war of aggression. Um, and that is important not just for Russia, to have internalized, but a lot of other countries, right? I mean, there's been a lot of the most obvious talk is, is, is you know, whether China is looking at this and thinking about what might happen in Taiwan and, and, uh, and not just, you know, in terms of like whether it's a good idea, but also like, you know, could Taiwan be resupplied the way that Ukraine is resupplied? It's an island, it'd be more challenging, right? Um, there's, um, so there's that, right? Uh, why are we doing this here and not other places? I mean, there's a whole host of reasons. One of them is that it's easier here, right? Um, and uh, in Ukraine, you have an effective leader, an effective military, right? 
End game is difficult, right? So what is the end game? Uh, <laughs> that kind of depends on what happens on the battlefield, right? I mean, like, there's sort of like, you know, could we have a ceasefire now? I mean, Russia would probably love it, right? We'll reconstitute our forces, sit here on the territory that we've taken, and never give it back, right? You know, Ukraine, for obvious reason, uh, wants to push off the aggressive force and liberate the villages that have suffered under a brutal occupation marked by torture, murder, and rape. Reasonable enough from the Ukrainian side, I understand that. Uh, and then on top of that, there's sort of prudential concerns about nuclear weapons, right? Uh, Russia's done a certain amount of saber rattling, and they certainly want us in the West very concerned, right? Um, but I think also, in the long term, it's probably not a good thing if nuclear blackmail means that, you know, strong nations with nukes can invade other nations and, um, and threaten to use their nukes and then use that to gain territory. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous and delicate situation, right? But there, there aren't necessarily easy answers. And I, I, I think that, for the most part, I think that the United States has behaved pretty well in terms of what they've done. How about the gentleman up here, front row? Let's get an easy one. Come on, this is going to be easy. Ask, a, ask him what he's doing for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's your, your Thanksgiving present. All right. <laughs> now, that, now that you've uh, tackled nonfiction and fiction and essays and short stories and novels, I wonder if your, your next frontier might be biography. Yeah. And this is actually very interesting. Well, I, I, have, I have a reason for having that thought. Yeah. I just finished a terrific biography uh, called The Gangster for Capitalism with yeah, yeah. Smedley Butler. Butler. Went, after he finished his career, trashed his entire life <laughs> and work in a book called uh, w War is a Racket. Yep. Uh, so if, if, if you could find someone like that, I, I'm sure <laughs> we would all read the biography. And if you can't, could you invent someone like that to build a novel around? So I'll tell you what I'm doing next. And it's kind of, it's not biography exactly, but um, it is a novel. But so my, my maternal grandfather was a career diplomat, uh, served all over the place. He, he started out in the labor uh, movement. Um, he was uh, Adlai Stevenson's like labor rep on the Adlai Stevenson. He wrote his labor speeches, actually. Uh, Post-World War, he like taught Germans how to set up unions, uh, back when we knew more about that. Uh, he did that in Sicily, too. He showed up and he was like, uh, so what do, you, what do you workers want from your employers? And they're like, we want a chicken for Christmas. And he's like, I'm not going to give these guys the world, but, <laughs> you know, we can, we'll start there. Um, and he served all over the place. My, my, uh, my mother and, and six, uh, sorry, five aunts uh, grew up all over the place. In the early 60s, he was ambassador to Norway and accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of Henry Kissinger. The Norwegian students threw snowballs, uh, which I think is a delightfully Scandinavian form of protest. <laughs> and then his next posting was to be from 66 to 68, the ambassador to Czechoslovakia. So when Charter 77, the dissident movement uh, started, he was there. Now during that time, my grandmother was there. The uh, diplomat spouses did a lot of work, you know, very important work, the job. Never acknowledged, really. Um, and, you know, at dinners, it always used to annoy my grandmother that her placard would just say, wife of, you know. Um, and which, for some things, has a benefit. So the Italian ambassador was leaving. And the Italian ambassador's wife came to my grandmother and said, during the time that uh, I've been here, I've passed messages between Vatican City and the underground church, and I'd like you to take over that role. And my grandmother wanted to do it, but the American, like, they were just under so much pressure. The Vatican City police were across the street. They were always, like, doing kind of, like, harassing things. You know, like, my, my grandmother's walking on the sidewalk with, you know, one of her daughters holding her hand, and there's, like, a van behind them that then speeds up and goes up on the curb and then, you know, swerves away. Uh, that kind of stuff, right? Or, um, and so she turned it down. But I figured I would write a novel uh, about 
if she'd said yes, and I have my grandfather's unpublished memoirs, and I have letters and recollections from my aunt. So I'm doing like the work of a biographer uh, about my grandparents, but um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what I want with it. So that's that's what I'm working on now. So yeah, interesting that you asked that specific you're, question. You're, tr you're you're traveling somewhere, or you just got back from somewhere? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to head to Prague in going in, to Prague. in, in, okay. in spring. So um, we had another. What do we got time for one or two more? How about right here? Oh, wait for the mic. Here we go with the mic. Thank you. Um, in the book, several times you mention the authorization for the use of military force, and it seems like this circumvents Congress, right? So why does Congress allow the executive branch to continue to um, rule under this? Because they don't want to vote on these things. They don't want to vote on these things. Right, think of Hillary Clinton, right, voting for a very popular war, right. When 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 we, you know, went into Iraq, that was extremely popular, and she was with the tide of the overwhelming tide of public opinion. And they came back to haunt her, right. They don't want to be forced to make those hard political calls, and they're difficult. They're genuinely difficult, right. So. Uh, Horn of Africa is a good, good example. We're continuing the mission uh, against a group that like has never done anything really outside their region, and like you know, I always say like, well, there's like intelligence chatter that they're playing on, whatever. There's there's always going to be something like that, right? Do they have the capability? to strike America, is it really in America's interest to be doing this? Are we actually causing a better situation there, right? Um, because I'm not, I'm decidedly far from convinced that like if our major interaction with a region is periodically killing people from time to time, and that's what America's presence means in that region, even if they're bad people all the time and we never make any mistakes, which we definitely do, there's been some excellent reporting from Arthur John in the New York Times about that, um, I don't think that's a long-term recipe for success, right? Uh, now, if you vote for that, that's one type of vote. If you vote against it, and then there is some sort of terrorist attack on the homeland, right? That's not in your interest. I understand why people don't want to be forced to make difficult political calls, um, which is why it's really important that Congress be forced to. I think that if we're going to be killing people overseas, the president should be forced to regularly explain the mission, explain what it costs, explain what the end state is, what the benchmarks of success are gonna be, and they should have to vote on it every couple years so that we can actually see, are we, are we achieving the things that we said we were gonna achieve? Or is this mission just continuing to go because of inertia? Uh, Hold on, Saeed, Saeed. I have a, I have a question from Tom Slay, uh, oh. distinguished oh, professor right, yeah, of on. poetry, <laughs> Tom joining Slay. us on Zoom. And um, so I'll read this to you. It's actually for both of you. I'll read it to you. Um, I'll read it to you now. Phil Saeed, terrific conversation. Can you please talk a bit about the fundamental paradox that I see in all your work, fiction and nonfiction? And it's this. The fascination and repulsion that you feel toward violence. Yeah. One thing I've experienced in the journalism I've done is feeling how one's ordinary political convictions collide with your emotional responses. Example, when there was the traffic jam 40 miles long at the beginning of the Ukraine-Russian war, I kept wondering why no one was bombing the convoy. And yet the consequence for individual Russian soldiers made me feel very uneasy. How do you deal with that kind of moral and spiritual unease? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. There's a scene in Full Metal Jacket where there's a, I don't know if you've seen Full Metal Jacket, there's a machine gunner, they're in a helicopter, and he's like this lunatic, and he's pulling the trigger, and he's going, hey, get some, get some, yeah, get some. You, all right, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so I was talking with a friend who uh, has been in a lot of combat, and he's also like a deeply humane, thoughtful person, right? Not a sociopath, like has done tremendous work, right? Like tremendous humanitarian work. Like save people's lives, right? Um, leveraging connections to help people. Um, 
And I asked him what shooting in combat felt like. And he sent me that clip, and he was like, it feels like that. As messed up as it is, he didn't use the word, as effed up as it is, that's what it feels like. And I think, you know, it's funny, like, if we just go back to Full Metal Jacket, I recently, like, mentioned that um, uh, it's, like, the greatest recruiting commercial for the Marine Corps, right, ever made. And all these film critics came wait, on. Wait, wait. Full Metal Jacket? Overwhelmingly. Every Marine loves that movie. It's the most movie. terrifying movie. Yeah. What am and I every film critic, like, all these film critics came in to, like, I was getting, like, quote tweeted. And people were like, look at this idiot, you know? And the idea is, like, how could... Uh, it's an anti-war movie, only an idiot. Arlie Ermey was given like uh, an honorary promotion or whatever as a result of what he had done for the Marine Corps for his role in that movie, right? There's no question that that movie deeply appealed to people, right? Now, if you're like a 45-year-old film critic, you think it's like, well, how could anybody uh, possibly look at that, right? Of course they do. There's a wonderful essay by Teilhard de Chardin, who was in World War I. He was a French Jesuit, uh, more famous for other stuff. But in 1917, right, and he's already, he's been at the front for, he was a stretcher bearer or whatever, front for years, been in major battles. He writes an essay called The Nostalgia of the Front, where he talks about, like, what is this longing? As soon as I leave the front, and when I'm at the front, I want to leave the front because I don't like death and pain. But as soon as I leave, I want to go back. Why, right? And you know, the first thing that he comes upon is like man's explorer nature, right? It's this site of cataclysmic destruction, you know. And he, and he talks about the people in the rear who are cl you know only like a couple miles away from the front but never go there. And he's like, I don't understand the people who who are so close but don't want to go there. I think even human beings, right? Uh, Gustav Hasford, who wrote the short timers, which Full Metal Jacket is based on, to keep with the Full Metal Jacket theme, um, has a wonderful movie review of uh, Rambo, First Blood Part Two, that he penned in Penthouse Magazine, um, where all really good film criticism happens, apparently. <laughs> and um, uh, he's like, why did we go to war? They've been asking that question since Hitler was a corporal. We were young, and the young like to travel. There are a lot of people who, when you write about war, they think you're somehow morally wrong if you write about the love that people have for it. I don't think you're being serious if you try and, and cordon off some aspect of human experience. Ernst Jünger saw more combat <laughs> right, than most of the anti-war poets that you're familiar with. And he found something so valuable in it. If you want to really write about war, you need to understand that because that's what you're dealing with, right? It doesn't do you any good if you want to alleviate human suffering to pretend that human nature is not what it is. Mac, anything else from Tom before we, okay. But, what, One more round of applause for Phil Clark. <laughs>